This is the new Peugeot 208, car of the year 2020. Is it really better than the Renault Clio? I had to start with this question because I picked up the 208 test car on 2nd of March 2020, the day the results of the European Car of the Year are usually announced at the Geneva Motor Show. This year the Geneva Motor Show was cancelled due to the coronavirus threat, but the results were announced anyway, only with less fanfare. Before I try understanding the Car of the Year juror's decision, let's focus on the facts. Peugeot 208 is very similar in size to the Renault Clio at 405.5 cm, the 208 is just half a centimeter longer, but the Clio has 4 cm longer wheelbase, which in 208 is just 254 cm. Renault is also wider at almost 180 cm versus less than 175 in the Peugeot. At 143 cm, the 208 is also 1 cm lower than the Clio. However, as far as the design is concerned, Peugeot wins hands down. The new 208 looks modern and aggressive, whereas the new Clio looks… well, like a facelift. Even Renault designers said they didn't want to tamper too much with what the clients love. They improved things which needed improving, like the interior, but clients buying a lower spec car may not notice it. I recall seeing a dealer Clio on display in a shopping mall a couple of months ago and being unable to distinguish at first glance whether it was the old or the new model because the interior looked rather dull. Peugeot 208 has these vertical day running lights which resemble lion's fangs. We've seen these on the equally beautiful 508 and from a distance it roars, maybe it doesn't roar, it kind of purrs. I'm small but fierce like the rusty spotted cat. Google it. The 208 not only looks modern, but compared to the Clio, it better addresses the market trends. You can have your Peugeot with a petrol or a diesel engine, as well as with an electric powertrain. The Clio will get a plug-in hybrid sometime in 2020. The boot. The VDA capacity is 265 liters plus 44 in the spare tire. Well, this is where the repair kit lives in this car. If you were to fill the boot with water rather than the VDA 20 by 10 by 5 blocks, you'd get around 300 liters plus 100 liters under the floor. But unless you carry duffel bags with soft elastic content, the boot is not particularly commodious. The Hyundai i10 has a slightly smaller boot according to VDA. It also has a double floor, therefore flat loading area with the seats folded, something the Peugeot doesn't have, but let's not be picky. Of course, a liter can have a different shape. The i10 boot is, from my perspective, less usable. This is one of those subjective parameters you need to assess by yourself during a test drive. But objectively, the i10 tailgate goes up on its own and in the 208 I have to assist it, like in, you know, Ford Fiesta. In the back, it's just bad. The door opening is narrow, it's dark, it's cramped. Good thing there are USB ports and the door pockets are better than in the Clio. Not much better, but better. And there's also no armrest. In the front, things appear modern at first glance. It was the original 208 which debuted at the 2012 Geneva Motor Show that first featured the new iCockpit design. So what's this iCockpit business all about? In modern cars, the driver is faced with plethora of information. Back in the day, it was only speed, maybe revs, water temperature. Today, it's sat-nav, average fuel economy, range, driver aids. Data is presented in various places, but most important pieces of information should be available at a glance. Some car makers use head-up displays. Peugeot decided to raise the instrument binnacle to the top of the dash and make the steering wheel smaller, so it remained in the same place, but the wheel itself would not obstruct the view. 
This was a controversial move as some drivers find this unintuitive and for others the steering wheel is too low for getting in and out or too high to actually see what's on the instrument binnacle. For me the size is just about right and I got used to it. I actually like it. I also like the 3D display themes. It's not particularly useful but whimsical. I think it adds to the general feeling of modernity. I'm less fond of what's on the central display. It's years of PSA infotainment system development, not particularly responsive or clear. Also the buttons below are hard to read. At first glance there are only physical buttons, but then you realize there is a second row which is touch sensitive. The icons are too small, it's hard to see down there. I'm sure with time you'll learn to use them, but it could have been implemented differently. On the plus side, large door pockets, a lot of storage including a deep glove box and small storage under the armrest. Here is a tiny cubby, probably for the key, you'll forget you left it here. There are good cup holders as well as USB-A and USB-C ports, so you can connect your phone using MirrorLink if supported or just use Android Auto. Interesting thing about the Android Auto is that even with Google navigation on, you still get traffic sign recognition and speed trap warnings on the dial on the instrument cluster before the driver. It's not something you get in every car. For example, in the Mazda 3, launching Android Auto means that there is no traffic sign information and in the Passat, Android Auto would cut off semi-autonomous driving functions. This is the three-cylinder, 100 horsepower, 1.2 liter petrol motor. A couple of months ago, I drove the 130 horsepower 208. It was quick, but a waste of money for city driving. Definitely not worth three grand. Maybe 1500 to get the automatic because the manual is typical Peugeot, as wooden as that Peugeot pepper grinder. According to WLTP, the Peugeot 208 with a 100 horsepower 1.2 liter engine should use between 5.4 and 5.6 liters per 100 kilometers combined. I'm getting way above 6 and that's because I have to keep the car in lower gear than the Eco Nani suggests. Otherwise, the engine feels like it's about to stall. How is the 208 to drive? I love the small steering wheel and the direct feel in Peugeot cars, a couple of turns and you're ahead of everyone in traffic. It's very nippy and on twisty roads, uh, yeah, this is where this car starts falling apart. Well, not literally, but like many hatchbacks, also the 208 has torsion beam suspension in the back. It's cheaper, it's more compact and it works fine in most cars, but the Peugeot torsion beam or twist beam likes to twist a bit too much for my liking. In mid-corner it can scare you to death. And I'm not talking about a moose test, I'm talking about driving fast on a twisty road, something us car fans like to do in our free time. The 208 is all over the place and it can understeer as well. I wouldn't complain too much because this is a super mini, not a car for hill climb racing, but Peugeot has created this illusion of an agile car which invites you to drive it enthusiastically. The suspension is great on uneven surfaces, but it doesn't cope with lateral g-forces. Here I need to address the tire issue. I've seen the Peugeot 208 moose test by KM77 and the car fared rather well. However, the moose test was performed on Michelin Pilot Sport 4 tires. Meanwhile, the press car I was driving in Poland was on something called the Euro Repar Reliance Winter. If you haven't heard about the Euro Repar, it's PSA's brand of aftermarket parts, including tires. I don't recall having driven on something as bad as these tires. The weather conditions were not particularly challenging. Plus 5 degrees Celsius, mildly moist tarmac. On good tires, I wouldn't notice anything. During this time, I also had the new Opel Corsa test car. That's 
pretty much the same as the Peugeot 208, but the Corsa was on Continental Winter Contact tires and the difference in grip was colossal. I don't know what are Peugeot's OEM tires, but don't leave the dealership on Euro Repars. And one more thing, regardless of the tires, I uphold my opinion about the twist beam being too twisty. But that's normal in a Peugeot. Now, back to the regular review. Is the 208 comfortable to drive? Well, there is no lumbar support adjustment. I've sat in less comfortable seats, but I wouldn't mind having better support for my spine. Also, the backrest tilt adjustment is a knob hidden in a tight space between the seat and the B pillar. Why not use a pull lever like in the Renault? And yes, the 208 cockpit feels very tight. Visibility is just bad and there is no way I can defend it in a city car. Especially since PSA keeps using that fake 360 camera business. Uh, here the image from a backup camera is stitched to create a temporary 360-like view of the surroundings. In a car with a 3D instrument cluster? Seriously? Prices of the Peugeot 208 start at 15,500 euro for a 75 horsepower petrol engine variant with a 5 speed manual. This 1.2 100 horsepower Allure model with options costs about 22,500 euro. There is also a diesel version as well as the potentially popular electric model with a claimed WLTP range of 340 kilometers. I looked at the Car of the Year juror scores and verdict justifications. Peugeot 208 won for two reasons. Firstly, and I'm not trying to belittle Peugeot's victory, the competition was either weak or hard to justify from a European buyer's point of view. Sure, a Tesla Model 3 can score high with the Dutch jurors and one or two jurors were enchanted by the Porsche Taycan, but the Peugeot 208 received consistent, solid, medium scores, whereas the competition was all over the place. Secondly, this is something I said earlier and it also transpired from juror notes. From the start, the 208 is available with a conventional and electric powertrain, whereas the Clio will only launch its hybrid soon. Also, the Clio doesn't look new, and a large display on the dashboard doesn't help its case, as not many buyers will get to experience it. The new Peugeot 208 is a car with great potential, and I feel it could have been so much better. Perhaps the electric version will convince me, but as far as the ICE version is concerned, I'll have the Clio. And how do you like the new Peugeot 208? Are you thinking of buying one? One with a regular engine or maybe an electric version? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, share, press the bell and do whatever else you want. Just come back here next Friday for a new episode or just browse through reviews which are linked probably somewhere on the screen here. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.